A reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is God's word. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to to see you. Amy, thank you for reading that. We'll come to Ephesians 2 in a few moments. But our text this morning is Romans Uh, chapter 15 and verse 7, which says, Therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Um, A few months ago, I had my first experience of Bucky's. (laughs) And let's just uh, just say I'm still processing it. Um, If you're unfamiliar, um, imagine a gas station but the size of Connecticut, and you'll be fairly close to what Bucky's is. I think the one I went to had... 80 to 100 gas pumps. Uh, the store part of it is, is, is vast. I read somewhere that's the size of a football field or something like that. Um, but the concept behind it isn't just to do everything much bigger. The concept behind it is gas stations are a necessity and they're often an unpleasant necessity. So the whole idea with Bucky's is let's try and make every single aspect of that gas station experience as good as it possibly can be. And so they've kind of got a reputation now that, you know, there's freshly smoked brisket in the store. The, they are famous for having clean bathrooms because everyone knows what gas station bathrooms can be like. And it's become a kind of a, a cult following. Um, there are people who will go on a trip to go to Bucky's. It's become a destination in itself. And I think they're building a couple around here. So you get to, to sample this if you haven't yet. But it it represents something that I want us to be thinking about this morning, because what is true for them with the experience of being at a gas station is meant to be true for us as a church in our experience of one another. Uh, they've They've sought to upgrade the experience of being at a gas station. Our theme this morning is how the gospel is meant to upgrade our relational life together as God's people. Uh, We're in this series looking at the Emmanuel Essentials of Jesus' community and calling. We started with Jesus uh, last week because he's why we're here. Um, A friend of mine recently was asking me about Emmanuel. He said, what do you you guys believe in Emmanuel? And I was thinking, you know, there's, there's particular theological traditions we can say that we're located in, but I just thought actually the best way of saying what we believe is to say, well, we believe we're nothing without Jesus Christ. That seemed to me the easiest way to boil down what we, uh, what we believe at Emmanuel. We're nothing without Jesus Christ, but with Jesus Christ, every aspect of our life together is meant to be different. Uh, with Jesus, there is meant to be an upgrade to our community life. Ray Ortland, our founding pastor, often says, church isn't just a new community. Church is meant to be a new kind of community. And just as last week we saw how Jesus is so unique and so utterly singular, 
surely the community life of those who come to know him should also be unique and singular. And this is something the Bible itself puts a high premium on, that the quality of our life together is meant to be an apologetic for the beauty of Jesus himself. Uh, Jesus says this in John 13, verse 35. He said, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And I think in the modern Christian world today, we, we mentally complete that sentence in a different way. We think by this, all people will know you are my disciples, if you're more impressive, if you're more put together, if you're more awesome then people will know you are my disciples. But Jesus says, no, it's your, our love for one another that is meant to singularly mark us out as being his. Uh, we're not just to proclaim the truth. We're to socially embody it as well. So the, the Christian leader, Francis Schaeffer of the 20th century, he once wrote of this verse. He said, Jesus is giving the world permission to judge whether we are true Christian disciples on the basis of whether we love one another. Uh, the gospel of Jesus is meant to leave a unique relational dynamic in its wake. Or as we've come to, to put it at Emmanuel, gospel doctrine leads to gospel culture, which is the burden of the text today. Romans 15 verse 7, Paul writes, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So I want us to walk through this verse. Um, I want us to walk through it backwards. We're going to start at the end and work our way to the front. So our first point is this, for the glory of God. Um, in this part of Romans, Paul is, is helping his readers learn how to handle life together as God's people when there are so many differences, so many potential disagreements. And interestingly, Paul gives as much space to that as he gives to explaining justification by faith in this letter. It's that important. And Romans 15 verse 7, as Paul kind of concludes this section, again shows us what's at stake. This is all for the glory of God. The glory of God is at stake in how we relate to one another. So tending to our community life, our community health, isn't trivial. Uh, it's not a waste of time. It's not one of those, you know, if, if time permits and there's a bit more money in the budget, we'll get to it kind of things. It's bound up with the glory of God. Now, the glory of God in the, in the Bible is, is that which makes God compelling. God's glory is what makes him uniquely consequential. It's his beauty, his worthiness, it's his gravity, his weightiness. And of course, we see God's glory in creation. Uh, Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Um, back in Romans 1, Paul showed us how creation shows God's invisible qualities, his power and his strength. It's why we're so drawn to the beauty of creation. We're seeing a reflection of the glory of God. Um, there's a very busy highway um, out of London towards the northwest. It's, it's the road you take if you're going to Oxford or Birmingham, and it takes you all the way up to the west coast of Scotland. And I lived for many years in sort of Oxford-y, London-y part of, of the country, so drove along the M40 more times than I can possibly count. And there's a section of the road where you're just coming into Oxfordshire, and you, the, the, the highway cuts through a range of hills called the Chilterns, and all of a sudden, you see all of Oxfordshire laid out before you. It's a beautiful little moment in the journey. And I was driving there one, one summer's evening a few years ago. And as we kind of cut through the hills and rounded the bend and saw this view, the sun was just setting beautifully on the horizon. And the sky looked like it was on fire. It was one of those just immediately stunning sunsets. And here's the thing. This is a really busy highway people were pulling over onto the shoulder, which I don't know how that works over here, but in, in, in the UK, you only do that in an emergency. Um, that's not there just as a convenience, but people were pulling over to get out and take pictures. Now, they didn't know they were doing this, but they were marveling at the glory of God. 
the glory of God, that the beauty of who he is turns heads and even stops cars. And Paul is showing us in Romans 15 verse 7 that that very same glory of God is also meant to be manifest in the local church. In other words, you don't have to see a sunset or drive to the Grand Canyon or go to some other amazing part of nature to see something of God's glory. The beauty of heaven is meant to be visible from how we treat one another. So the question is, well, well, how? And the answer is not by being perfect. Because Paul has spent a lot of real estate in, in his letter to the Romans showing us that we're saved by grace, by grace alone, as we were singing earlier. God's, God gives his very best to those who deserve it the least. Becoming a Christian doesn't mean you suddenly become sinless and perfect. We remain undeserving. We remain needy. We remain sinful. And yet there's a way we can be together as fellow forgiven sinners that can bring great glory to God. Now on a Sunday morning, there will be countless various groups meeting across this city. There'll be sports and fitness groups, there'll be book clubs, there'll be kind of special interest organizations, there'll be activist meetings of various kinds. And I'm sure all of those have got various things going for them. What makes the church different isn't that we're committed to meeting together. Lots of people are committed to meeting together. What is meant to be different is there's, there's meant to be a uniqueness to the way we are with each other. For the glory of God. So that's the first point. Moving in to the next phrase in the verse, we get to why it is the church can be like that. Uh, how it is we can bring glory to God in this unique way because Paul says Christ has welcomed you. Christ has welcomed you. Paul has spent a lot of chapters in the book of Romans explaining the gospel and now he just boils it down to four words. If you want to summarize the gospel in four words, Christ has welcomed you. That is the gospel. And it's how a group of random, failing, sinful, wounded people like us can bring glory to God is because Christ has welcomed us. Now that word welcome often feels a little bit tepid, a bit sort of watered down. Sometimes we hear the word welcome and we sort of think of the thing you're meant to do when you're not in the mood for it. Someone unexpected turns up at the front door and you, I'm supposed to welcome you, so you fake a smile and come on in. That is not what Paul is talking about here. Uh, the word Paul is using for welcome in the original text, it's a strong word. Other translations translate accept one another as Christ has accepted you, but acceptance sounds like merely tolerating. We're not to tolerate each other because Christ hasn't merely tolerated us, he's welcomed us. So the kind of welcome Paul is speaking of here is a welcome of deep belonging, because Christ, through his death on the cross for us, has pulled us deep into his heart. That is what it means for him to welcome us. Now, I spent many years of my Christian life thinking the gospel was mainly about what we're saved from. And it was many years before I began to understand what we're actually saved into, what we're saved for. Because the message of, of the gospel isn't just, okay, the problem's been managed, you're free to go now. The, the message of, of Jesus is, you're free to come. Not being sent off, but being pulled in. We haven't only been pardoned, we've been welcomed. Uh, Tim Keller once explained in a sermon that the kind of difference between pardon and, and adoption or, or welcome, and he said, 
A, a president, one of the perks of being a president is you get to pardon people. But if someone is pardoned by the president, imagine there's a, there's a prisoner on death row and they receive this stunning news, you've been pardoned by the president. Now that doesn't mean that prisoner can now go and knock on the front door of the White House and expect to kind of join them for dinner each night. He's been pardoned, he's not been welcomed. But Paul is saying we have been welcomed by Jesus Christ. Pardoned, yes, but more than that. Welcomed. Uh, that's why I wanted those verses from Ephesians 2 read, because they, they bring home to us the way in which the, the gospel is divine hospitality. Paul says, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We've been saved by divine hospitality. We were far. We were miles away from God. Nowhere near him. Not even facing the right direction. And now we have been brought into his presence. We've been brought near. We were strangers. We were unfamiliar with, with God. We were oblivious to his ways. We we just weren't interested. And now we're part of his family. Part of his household. God, God has brought us into his home. He sat us at his table and he's given us the family name. So when Paul says Christ has welcomed you, that the kind of welcome with which Christ has welcomed us, is an undeserved welcome. Christ welcomed us when we had nothing to offer him and deserved nothing from him. When Christ saw us in our need, in our messed upness, in our sin, he didn't recoil in disgust. He didn't tell us to come back when we've sorted ourselves out. He made the first move towards us. That's the welcome Paul is speaking of. And it's costly. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, we've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Him welcoming us wasn't, wasn't easy. It was costly. We have been included because at the cross, Jesus was excluded. We've been folded in because he was forsaken. He went through divine unwelcome so that we could be pulled in. He welcomes us at the cost of all that he had. That's how all in Jesus is on welcoming us. He held nothing back. He gave all that he had to welcome us. That's the gospel we believe. And that's the welcome we are called to embody. Because the sign that we've received this welcome is that we now want to extend it to others. We long to be to others what God has been to us. So therefore, Paul begins this verse by saying, therefore, welcome one another. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. This welcome we've received, we're now to offer to each other. What has happened vertically we're now to embody horizontally. We are to one another the welcome of Jesus. So again, Christ has welcomed you is gospel doctrine. Therefore, welcome one another is gospel culture. We're to take what we know and have tasted about Jesus welcoming the undeserving and we're to make that a felt reality in each other's lives. We're to so open our hearts and our lives to one another. We're to embody that very undeserving, costly, all-in, wholehearted welcome of Jesus Christ. Uh, let me pull out two or three quick verses from the New Testament that, that get to something of what this welcome involves. In uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 13, Paul says, Love one another with brotherly affection. In other words, love one another sincerely from the heart 
And he adds, seek to show hospitality. Our welcome to one another is is more than a kind of nodding acquaintance because the welcome of Jesus was more than a nodding acquaintance. Just as he pulled us into his heart, we're to, to pull one another into our hearts and therefore into our lives, into our homes even. And I love that Paul there doesn't just say, show hospitality. He says, seek to show hospitality. Similarly, 1 Peter 4 verse 9 says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Because Peter knows me. And sometimes it's easy to, to go through the motions and do the correct thing and, and not have your heart in it. And so Peter says, no, no, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Did Jesus grumble when he died for us? No, it's to be our heart's desire to welcome one another because it was for the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross in his welcome of us. Jesus loved welcoming you. And he still does. And therefore we are to welcome one another with his welcome. So I'm going to steal a sermon illustration from TJ from a few years ago. Uh, It's from, um, he probably stole it from Tim Keller, so it's, you know. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, The the first of the Hobbit movies, uh, Bilbo is, he's in his his little Hobbit home and he's he's just happy. He's shut the door on the world. He's got a pantry full of food, a quiet evening. He's just going to enjoy his own peace and quiet and space. And there's a knock on the door and a succession of dwarves just show up, barely acknowledge him and just walk into his house, start eating his food and and making themselves at home. And he's kind of wondering what on earth's going on. Every time he's trying to figure out, there's another knock at the door and more dwarves and a whole load of them have turned up. And then eventually Gandalf shows up and explains what is going on. And Gandalf says that he he put a sort of special magic mark on Bilbo's door as a signal to these dwarves, this is where to come. Just come here and be at home here. This is what you need behind this door. And TJ's point was, Jesus does the same with us. With our front doors, with our hearts, Jesus puts a mark on each one of us so that the rest of us can think, okay, that's where I can go. And I will be welcomed. I will be received. So hospitality is is one obvious outworking of this welcome. The, The second one I want us to think about is from Hebrews chapter 10 and its encouragement. Uh, Let me read from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Uh, The writer to the Hebrews says, Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, lots of things for us to to think about here, but I love the fact that he, he doesn't just say, stir one another up to love and good works. He says, let's consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. In other words, we should be giving time to thinking about how we can encourage each other. We're to consider how to stir one another up. That would be when you're, you know, you're taking a pause in the day and you're, you're kind of shifting your mind into neutral and staring out of the window for a moment. That would be a great thing to think about. Maybe think of particular people at Emmanuel and think, I wonder how I could encourage them in some way. He continues by saying, not neglecting to meet together. That's always going to be a danger. It's going to be easier to drift out of meeting together. We're not going to drift into it. As is the habit of some. But instead, encouraging one another. And here's what I love about this verse. The opposite in in Hebrews 10 verse 25, the opposite of not meeting together isn't meeting together. The opposite of not meeting together is encouraging one another. 
Because the assumption is that is what our gatherings are meant to produce, encouragement. So if you take up all the various elements that, that make up a, a gathering of God's people, there's singing and praying and teaching, there's often receiving communion, there may be other things going on, there's all kinds of conversations that happen around the place. The net effect of all of that is meant to be encouragement. We're meant to, to leave Emmanuel Nashville more encouraged than we arrived. Because we're receiving something in all of our interactions, we're receiving something afresh of the welcome of Jesus Christ through one another. We're to behave with one another in such a way that it makes the welcome of Jesus feel that bit more real, that bit more believable. We're to remind each other of it in the way that we are together. And encouraging one another means, means two things for all of us. It means, firstly, you need encouragement. I'm not, I'm not saying that based on having kind of stared at your life for the last few weeks. God says it here. You need encouragement. However you're feeling, however you're doing, however mature you are in the faith, at the beginning of this um, letter of, of, of Romans, Paul is talking about being eager to visit them in person because he says that we may be mutually encouraged. Paul needed encouragement. All of us need encouragement. And the other implication of Hebrews 10 verse 25 is that all of us can be in encouragement. None of us isn't needed here. All of us have a God-given way of being an encouragement to others. If you don't come to Emmanuel, we, we miss something. We're diminished. There's encouragement that won't happen because you're not here. So as we look around this room, as we think of one another, we are to assume that the people around us are less encouraged than they look. Sometimes we look at each other and think, I don't know if they need encouragement. They seem pretty okay. Let's work on the assumption that all of us are less encouraged than we appear. That all of us need more encouragement than may be immediately obvious. No one ever died from having too much encouragement. Plenty of people have from too little. So just err on the side of assuming, okay, they probably need encouragement. And one of the ways we encourage each other is by reminding each other of the welcome of Jesus himself. Because the welcome of Jesus tells me you matter profoundly. Jesus set his heart upon you. Jesus shed his blood for you. And I get to welcome you as Christ has welcomed me. And as we do that, Emmanuel Nashville begins to be something that nothing else in Nashville can be, which is a place where the glory of God is made known. A place where something of God's unique beauty is made visible through the way we are with each other. So friends, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let me pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for that welcome of Jesus. We thank you that the one who owed us nothing, who had, in one, in one sense, no business stepping into this world, did so for us. We thank you that in the death of Jesus, we see not only pardon for sin, but welcome for the sinner. 
that we are pulled now deep into the heart of Jesus and we will never be dislodged from it. Father, help us to so receive that welcome from Jesus that we instinctively find ourselves expressing it, even imperfectly, to those around us. Father, as we think about this, this property and the, the, the ways you are enabling us to purchase it, we pray that 4301 Charlotte Avenue would be the easiest place to discover the welcome of Jesus. And we pray this for the glory of God. Not that people would think much of us, but that people would think much of you. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.